Hello everyone and welcome back to Superboy Beyond and we have another commentary for you today. This is Season 1, Episode 2, A Kind of Princess, which is an episode that for some reason I thought we'd already done a commentary on. I guess we've just talked about this episode so many times that that's, I, I you know, I had a false memory of recording it. Or maybe it's one of the episodes that was just lost for one reason or another. I don't know. But it's a fun one. Uh yeah, I, I like this episode a lot. I know you do too. Yes. Um, yeah, so I, I think we should just get straight into this one. Yep. Uh, if this is your first time watching alongside us, you will not be hearing any of the audio from the episode itself. There will be a slight light effect on the screen, potentially, just so you can tell whether you've got your copy of the show synced up with ours. But it's in no way a substitute for watching the actual episode itself. So what we'll do is just count you in with the three, two, one, play. And as long as you hit play when we do, it should all be good. So get ready. Season one, episode two, A Kind of Princess. Three, two, one, play. Yeah, we've, we've talked quite a few times about this. How, you know, the early episodes of Superboy are usually thought of to be among the worst of the show but this is kind of an outlier isn't it it's, it's yeah. a surprisingly good episode and i think i think it's one of the best episodes of season one it it is it, it, it's definitely one of the best you know if not the best of season one i mean you know potentially um i, I know, mean maybe revenge of the alien might be my favorite, or, or maybe even Hollywood, but or uh, Luther Unleashed again, or Mixus Pitlick. There, there's a there's a bunch of good episodes, but of the episodes that are probably among the least comic booky, this is one of the better ones. Yeah, and it of course has two great guest stars, um, Ed Winter, who was known for playing you know movie and TV tough guys in the seventies and eighties. And uh, of course, it has Julie McCullough as uh, Sarah. Hmm. And I like the character of Sarah, and I think her and John had have just great chemistry in this episode. Just even from this very first scene. And it is funny as well because this is one of the few episodes where Lana is jealous of Clark being on a date, which is. Didn't happen very often that I can think of. You know, Lana typically didn't really think of Clark in that way. Yeah. Maybe they were thinking they were going to take their relationship in a slightly different direction early on. And uh, I'm not sure. I'm thinking this is post uh, Julie McCulloch's uh, a stint on Growing Pains. Never watched Growing Pains, but uh, yeah, she, apparently I do. Know, uh, I do know the story about why she got fired, yeah. which I think was kind of a shitty thing, to be honest. Yeah, but we're not going to get into that. <laughs> no, and we're not going to get into the style of Growing Pains that was the cause. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to. I think about if anybody's interested, you can. You can. You can. Uh, you can Google it. Yeah. I think she's good in this episode, and I know we've talked about it before, but it is a shame that she never came back in the show. It would have been a bit difficult to bring her back for season two, just purely because it's a different lead actor. But uh, not necessarily, not necessarily. I mean, they could still they could still bring her back, you know, just just do it with Gerard. Yeah, yeah. This actor there in the uh, striped suit has appeared in so many episodes of Superboy; it's unreal. But I know him just because he was in the episode of Only Fools and Horses that had a few Superboy actors in it. But I like this actor. I think his name is Anthony something. And yeah, he's just one of those solid character actors that I always I always have a smile on my face when he pops up in something because he typically puts in a solid performance.
And, you know, this is a great early episode for Superboy as well, because it's one of the few times where the criminals don't know who Superboy is. Like, they were gen- they, they had no idea what was happening just then. The only problem I have with this scene, and it's a small one, is, yeah, Clark saw them putting the bomb in the car. He then changes to Superboy, stops stops uh, Mr. Danner from getting killed, and then lets the guys go get away? Yeah, a little bit strange. It's the same complaint that a lot of people have for the uh, for the CW version of The Flash. The amount of times that the criminals get away when, in theory, The Flash could just like do a lap of the entire city and catch them. Like, you know, the Flash is 30 seconds late getting there. And he's like, oh, they got away. It's like, no, you're the fucking Flash. Yeah. Just just go like this. Just go up and down. Just do a just do a full canvas of the block. You could do it in about 30 seconds. Catch them. But that's the problem with doing a episodic superhero show about a speedster when you have to fill 22 episodes a year. Yeah. It's like how we could catch every criminal if the Flash didn't stop to have a conversation with them before <laughs> every or fight. If, if he did, if he didn't have so much angst about Iris. Yeah. But if instead of like appearing and then having like a taunting conversation with a criminal, if he just put like the meta cuffs on them the moment he got to the building, it's over. But I always think it's a funny criticism of superhero shows, though, because you you kind of have to let some of these things go that is a very that is particularly silly one of superboy though you know it's different when you know he you know especially and this is especially in the in the gerard years when he has a choice get the bad guy or save the people who are in in danger Mm -hmm. obviously mr danner was not in danger any longer he saw the direction the car went he could have gone after it Mm -hmm. definitely And I think this is the first appearance of Lieutenant Harris. Yeah, I don't think he was in Jewel of Tetrakal. And I don't think he was in Countdown to Nowhere in either version. Mm. I like I like Harris. I always thought he's a fun character. It's a Maybe shame we could have him go back to season two. Yeah. Maybe we can have him transfer to Metropolis now. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to bring too many old characters back, though, because we've got a bunch of new ones to introduce still. And, you know, the chemistry between Ed Winter and and Julie here is, is really good. You know, you, you kind of feel that they are a father and daughter. Yeah. And, you know, you understand a bit about the characters. She's a little bit naive, but... He's also very good at, I guess, giving presents and gifts and keeping her happy or whatever. You learned a fair bit about the characters from a scene like that. And now we get to see the real Mr. Danner. Yeah, and he, he's certainly playing this anger well. Like I said, like I said, you know, he he was known for playing tough guys. Hmm. I think one of the biggest roles he had, you know, up to this point, was his frequent guest appearances on Mash. He played a, a character called uh, Colonel Flag. Hmm. Colonel Rick Flag. <laughs> No. <laughs> okay. That would be an interesting bit of casting, though. Maybe he's a little bit too old by this point. Unless he's Rick Flag Senior. <laughs> and I gotta say, she she does really come across as as kind of spoiled. A little bit, yeah. But still, you can tell, you know, she's got a sweetness to her that 
you know, is quite endearing. And I just appreciate this, that this is one of the episodes where, you know, Clark gets a love interest. Usually Superboy does, or Superman does. Like, the superhero always gets the girl. It's like a well-worn trope. But yeah. Clark Kent very rarely got the attention. Maybe in Lois and Clark a fair bit, but only really from the Maggie Sawyer character. I forget her the character's name they changed it to. And it wasn't really Maggie Sawyer, I know, but Mason Drake. Mason Drake. That's it. That's but that's Farrah Forky. That's the actress that we cast for uh, Maggie Sawyer for uh, yeah. season five. Yeah. And she will not have the hots for Clark for obvious reasons to anyone that read the comics. <laughs> yeah. Although being 1993, I imagine we'll have to uh, be quite subtle. I like that TJ's got a date as well. Well, Tom, TJ has a different date every episode. True, but I always still like to see it because, you know. He got, he got, unlike, more unlike more Andy, more. who's, yeah, but I mean, unlike Andy, who's a bit lecherous at times, TJ was always a very respectful person with the women that he was dating, I think. I mean, he's a bit of a player, sure. But he's a nice player. Exactly. Though I don't think anyone beat uh, his uh, relationship with Nata with Natasha. They do have good chemistry. This scene works, you know. And theoretically, you know, I know he's not playing the Urkel Clark with John, but he's still. You sense that he's got inexperience, you know. <laughs> and that's why he's worried about causing harm. <laughs> Which is a similar problem that, you know, Clark in Smallville had to deal with before he learned to control his like powers a little bit better. <laughs> well, that's a freebie. He could have been a lot more suspicious about that. He probably should be a bit more on guard as well and looking for things because. <laughs> yeah, go. but as we, we later find out. Oh, wait, wasn't he in on it or something? Yeah. Yeah, I really like Lieutenant Harris. Yeah. That scene just showing, like, he's a good cop. Like, he knows what he's doing. And the fact that he picked up on all of that stuff is just like, yeah, you can keep lying to me. But, I mean, your story is full of holes, you know? <laughs> I like how competent they've written him in that scene. It's interesting that Clark is still willing to go to the father to help rather than try and find another way, knowing who Dana actually is like as, as a crime boss. Well, 
you know, th this this kind of shows, you know, Clark's, you know, naivete. Because remember, this is still early in his Superboy career. This is early in his, you know, journalism career. You know, very early because you know the criminals earlier had no idea who Superboy was when he showed up. They were as shocked as anyone. So yeah, he's obviously inexperienced in quite a few areas in this episode, including women. <laughs> Yeah, but he at least wants to try and help, mm. you know, and he knows that the best way he can help is helping Mr. Danner. Mm. But there's a little little uh, cynicism right there. Mm. It's the reporter in him, the investigator coming out a little bit. I've always liked this scene with the uh, the phone call between them. You do feel for her. It just really highlights just kind of what a prick he is <laughs> as a father, especially. I'd like to see the cutscenes that that lead up to this, because <laughs> you know there was deleted scenes. A lot of episodes of Superboy feel like there's a deleted scene or two. I kind of wish that they did have like the full like forty two minute runtime that most shows like this had. Like Lois and Clark, the extra time they had per episode. I mean, I mean later on it didn't really help them so much once the show got terrible. But early on, I mean, they used that time really effectively. This is the only wonky part of the episode. Hmm. I mean, I can still kind of see this as Superboy's finding out the kind of hero that he wants to be. Because this is sort of a Batman move at the moment, scaring him. But I mean, we've had Superman do that in a bunch of things. Like, well, I'm not. I'm not talking about, you know, the the actual, you know, the the method. I'm talking mm. about the, the SFX on it. It's a little wonky looking. Yeah, I don't think it looks any worse than the flying effects in a bunch of other episode, episodes, especially in season one. Yeah. Although it's well, funny in some ways. The the yeah, but it's it's funny. Season two, all the way through four, there's some things that season one actually did slightly better, but not many things. <laughs> I've never liked that shot as they fly behind the tree. I always think they should be further away. It looks like they would have smacked into it. Just the perspective was slightly off. They weren't quite far enough away from it. Maybe that's just me being... What the, you know, what the heck? The cops crash into a light pole? Yeah, maybe they wanted to do that old trope where the cops come in and crash into some garbage cans. But it was like, well, there isn't a garbage can. I'll do it into a light pole, even though it makes no sense. <laughs> It is a trope, isn't it, in old cop shows that they never know how to park. They always crash into something. It's like if there's a chase sequence, at some point they've got to go through an alley and crash into a few empty crates. Yeah. Full of straw or something for no discernible reason. <laughs> and now he's trying to trying to charm his daughter like he did before, and it's not working. No. Well, I mean, she's traumatized, and at the end of the day, like he's showing that his sort of crime empire is more important to him than she is, and that's got to be really heartbreaking. Because let's face it, you know, being a father that should take precedence. Indeed.
What, with you standing right next to her? It's a dumb plan. Yeah, this is one of those episodes that I really wish was a little bit longer. I just feel like the resolution's a little bit too quick. You know, to a certain extent, this is almost like an an opposite of um, bringing down the house. If you look at it, because in bringing down the house, it's Lana who is involved with somebody who turns out to be bad. And Clark is the one who's jealous. Yeah. In this it is the other way around, although, you know, she's not bad. It's her father. It's just. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a sad ending because I think she, you know, could have been an interesting love interest going forward. I realise this is a very episodic show and they couldn't have a love interest that goes on that isn't Lana. But I don't know. I would have liked maybe a three or four episode of arc with them before they split up something. Even if it didn't last that long. The only problem with with his relationship with her right here is, you know, it it just comes out of, of, and I get it, I get that it's episodic, but it just comes out of nowhere. You know, we're like in the middle of the of the relationship at the beginning of the episode, and we've never met her before. Yeah. Well, I mean, look at Troubled Waters as well. Like he goes to Smallville, and there's that girl from his childhood. I mean, I think that's another case where I liked that love interest a lot. And it's a shame that she didn't return either. But it's it's a very similar sort of... That's the name of the actor. Yeah, he's always good. Every time I see him pop up in something, I, I don't know, he's just one of those solid character actors. And who knows, if he's on Twitter, maybe I'll try and get him on the show at some point. Because I think that would be fun. Especially since he played multiple roles across the show. I mean, I know there's a bunch of actors that did. But I think he played like four different characters, if I remember right. Maybe it was only three. But uh, still, it's interesting. But yeah, A Kind of Princess, which is uh, sort of a a very rare, early, good episode. Um, You know, Jewel of Techacal, I don't think it's that bad, but I don't think it's that good either. Well, Um, what brings Jewel of Techacal down, and I don't want to speak ill of the dead. Yeah. Is Scott Wells, you know. I also don't think it's a great episode. I mean, I, th- I I like the Lana and her father sort of story thing that's going on, but it's about the only thing from the episode I do like. Yeah. I'll be honest. And the visual effects are pretty abysmal in that episode as well. <laughs> well, remember, it was still only, you know, the first couple of episodes. Yeah. You know, they didn't get the visual effects work done down until at least... I would say the fixer. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. You had that that long shot of him flying through the, through the, uh, the gymnasium as they're playing the, playing the, uh, the basketball game. Yeah. But I mean, that's just why I work. Mm. But But either way, I, I think this is a really solid episode. I, I think all the guest stars that are in it did a pretty good job. Um, it's nice to see, you know, our first appearance of um, God. His name's forgot. Uh, slipped me again. Lieutenant Harris. Harris. Lieutenant Harris. I think he's great. And again, like like you said earlier, it's a shame he didn't come back for season two. But uh, maybe he wasn't asked back, which I think is a bit of a shame. 
but the actor was brought back in season three once. As a different character? Yep. Wow, that's weird. Who was he playing uh, in season three? Part two of um, the episode where Superboy thinks he killed he killed a guy. Rebirth. Rebirth, yeah. Part two of Rebirth. He's he's playing the arms dealer. Right. I need to I need to watch Rebirth again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll do that as a commentary in the coming weeks or something. That could be a fun one. We'll do record both parts in one and just release it as a single episode maybe yeah but, but uh, like you know like you said this is a very solid episode i mean a couple of little wonky things but nothing major you yeah. know the performances um, are good you know i don't think there's anyone that put in a bad performance um maybe the henchman guy that faked the head injury but i think yeah. he was supposed to be giving a slightly unbelievable performance especially when he's talking to harris because the story he's telling is clearly bullshit. Yeah, in in multiple ways, you know. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I just think it's a really solid episode, and uh, thank you. I think it was Slayer Ranger who uh, asked us to do this one. You know, it's a great episode. Um, we don't take, you know, we don't need much convincing to watch this one. Really, we don't need much of an excuse at all. This is just one of our favourites from season one. But uh, anyway, on the season one scale, what would you give this out of 10? Uh, I think I'd give it like a, like an eight. Yeah, I'd give it an eight. Maybe I wouldn't say it's quite an 8.5. So yeah, I think eight is about, eight is about right, I would say. I don't think it's my favourite episode from the season. I'm thinking about it now. I think that would be Hollywood. But... Yeah, it's a good episode. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. And be sure to tune in again next week where we'll be doing a commentary on another one. Uh, maybe Rebirth, maybe something else. We'll see. Well, Rebirth, we got to do both parts all at once. Yeah, so we'll, we'll see if we've got time next week. If not, we'll just do a single episode. See how it goes. But uh, thank you all so much again. Goodbye.